SpaceX launched several dozen payloads on its fifth dedicated rideshare mission on May 25 from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Transporter 5 was SpaceX's fifth launch this month and 22nd launch this year, representing an average of one launch every 6.5 days since the start of 2022. The first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket, Booster B1061, flew its eighth mission and successfully came back to Earth for a vertical touchdown at Cape Canaveral's landing zone 1, several kilometers south of where it launched. All 59 payloads were deployed into a sun-synchronous orbit about 75 minutes after liftoff. The Transporter 5 mission featured a multitude of rideshare payloads. This includes NASA Ames Pathfinder Technology Demonstrator 3 spacecraft, which will feature the terabyte infrared delivery system. This payload will demonstrate new methods in laser communication to achieve a record-breaking 200 gigabit per second data transfer rate. An interesting payload aboard the mission was the Outpost Mars Demonstration 1, managed by Nanorax in partnership with Voyager and Maxer Technologies, to demonstrate for the first time how metal could be cut in orbit. Instead of deploying from the rocket to begin a standalone mission lasting months or years, the experiment remained attached to the Falcon 9's upper stage for a quick demonstration. A robotic arm with a cutting wheel was designed to cut through three CRES-316 stainless steel coupons, which is the same material used on the outer shell of the United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur. The cutting was scheduled to be activated about eight minutes after launch, shortly after second engine cutoff, and last approximately 10 minutes. As of May 28, Nanorax has not officially confirmed whether the demonstration was successful or not. This on-orbit metal cutting experiment is part of the outpost program managed by Nanorax, which is focused on transforming used launch vehicle upper stages into uncrewed controllable platforms. The Transporter 5 mission also carried Momentus Space's first Vigorite orbital transfer vehicle. Vigorite is propelled by a first-of-its-kind microwave electrothermal thruster that turns water into a superheated plasma propellant. The launch was treated mainly as a test flight of Vigorite, but it carried up to eight different small satellites. Spaceflight Incorporated also flew its Sherpa AC orbital transfer vehicle on Transporter 5. That version of the Sherpa spacecraft includes augmented attitude control capabilities that the company says make it well suited for flying hosted payloads. This vehicle carried two hosted payloads as well as three CubeSats. The next SpaceX Falcon 9 mission is scheduled for June 7, which will carry Egypt's NILESAT 301 communications satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. NASA announced on May 24 that a Crew Dragon heat shield structure, built by SpaceX for its next crew trip to the International Space Station, failed acceptance tests owing to a manufacturing issue. The heat shield's 4-meter composite is detachable and interchangeable between SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. SpaceX installs thermal protection tiles on the composite structure to protect the spacecraft from the searing heat of atmospheric re-entry. Our heat shield for Dragon, which is it's used a very advanced material called the phenolic impregnated carbon ablator, uh, which is the, really the best heat shield material you could possibly have. In early May, a heat shield composite structure intended for flight on SpaceX's Crew-5 mission to the ISS did not pass an acceptance test, forcing NASA and SpaceX to use another heat shield for the flight. The shield will undergo the same rigorous testing prior to flight. At the moment, it is unknown whether the replacement of the heat shield will affect the launch date of the Crew-5 mission, which is scheduled for September. After spending a little less than a week at the space station, Boeing's CST-100 Starliner spacecraft returned to Earth on May 25, landing intact with the help of parachutes and airbags in the New Mexico desert. The Starliner spacecraft lifted off atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket on May 19 and arrived at the International Space Station on May 20. The space capsule remained in orbit for about five days, while the crew unloaded the food and other supplies from its interior and performed in-person system checks. The spacecraft detached from the station on Wednesday at 6.36 p.m. UTC and descended to an orbit where it could initiate its descent with a re-entry burn. After jettisoning the service module, which provides power and propulsion during flight, it oriented its heat shield to take the brunt of the atmosphere, hitting some 1,650 degrees Celsius. At just under 9 kilometers in altitude, Starliner deployed two drogue parachutes, slowing the vehicle's descent considerably. The drogue chutes detached and Starliner's three main parachutes deployed at an altitude of about 2.4 kilometers, slowing Starliner to a manageable impact velocity. Starliner jettisoned its basal heat shield with about 900 meters to go, exposing its airbags, which quickly inflated to absorb the initial impact with the ground. The spacecraft landed at White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico at 10.49 p.m. UTC. 
The capsule has brought about 270 kilograms of cargo back to Earth, and Rosie the Rocketeer, a mannequin that rode inside Starliner to simulate what it will be like when humans ride on board. Had the landing of Starliner today. It was a picture-perfect landing. Uh, I think the landing point was about uh, 500 meters or so from where it was intended, just due to the winds being a little different than what was predicted. Uh, you know, it's great to have this incredible test flight behind us. Uh, the test flight was extremely successful. We met all the mission objectives. Though the orbital flight test is officially a success, Starliner did experience a few hiccups during the mission. For example, two of the thrusters on Starliner's service module failed during its orbital insertion burn, which occurred about 31 minutes after launch. A couple of OMAC thrusters, orbital maneuvering thrusters, that, that failed off in the port doghouse. We've got to do a little bit more work to figure out why they, they failed off. Subsequent to that, we did another phasing burn called the NC-1 burn. That burn went well. We used another thruster uh, in that port doghouse, and that worked fine. There are a total of 12 of these thrusters uh, on the aft part of the vehicle, and they're used for the big burns on orbit, like the insertion and rendezvous burns. The spacecraft also encountered problems with its docking ring, forcing it to retract and reset the system before successfully docking with the space station. According to NASA and Boeing, none of those problems proved to be fatal for the flight, and determining the root cause of the problems would likely have to wait until Starliner's post-flight inspections. After that, NASA and Boeing will determine if Starliner is ready to carry people to space in a test flight that could occur by the end of the year. After making necessary fixes inside the Vehicle Assembly Building, NASA's Space Launch System Moon Rocket and Orion spacecraft are targeted to return to Kennedy Space Center Launch Pad 39B on June 6 for the next wet dress rehearsal attempt ahead of the Artemis 1 mission. The giant rocket was transported back to the Vehicle Assembly Building on April 26, following three failed attempts to perform a full-fledged wet dress rehearsal. While inside the assembly building, teams completed several major objectives, including assessing the liquid hydrogen system leak at the tail service mast umbilical and replacing the interim cryogenic propulsion stage gaseous helium system check valve and support hardware. The loading of cryogenic propellants into the Mega Moon rocket at Pad 39B will take place no earlier than June 19, but weather and thunderstorms in Florida could change that. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. It's been nine months since we last saw a new Starship prototype coming out of the SpaceX factory in South Texas. Breaking the long pause, SpaceX rolled out Starship 24 from the Starbase rocket factory to the launch pad less than three kilometers away on May 26. From this angle, the payload bay door through which Starlink satellites will be deployed into orbit during the orbital test flight is clearly visible on the ship's side. Also, you can see that the nose cone of Ship 24 is shinier and has fewer welds than Ship 20. And there are some hexagonal elements on the nose cone, seemingly identical to a different set under tiles on the windward side. Those components could be antennas or temperature sensors. Uh, just uh, temperature sensors. Oh, cool. oh, oh uh, either, uh, I think so. Either temperature or, or uh, radio. They were the antennas or uh, temperature sensors, sensors. The ship had not yet received all six of its Raptor engines, and hundreds of thermal protection tiles were missing at the time of the rollout. After arriving at the launch site, SpaceX teams wasted no time in moving the unfinished rocket to a test stand to begin the ground test campaign. The tests began with an ambient pressure test, which involved filling the rocket's propellant tanks with gaseous nitrogen to ensure there were no leaks in the tanks or plumbing lines. The test went off without a hitch until several thermal protection tiles on the ship's nose cone barrel section fell off with a loud bang. It's currently unclear what exactly happened, and SpaceX immediately halted the pressure test and began venting the gaseous nitrogen from the tanks. Hours later, workers removed long tubes from the ship that may have been damaged during the tests. I'm not sure what this is, but it could be a part of the autogenous pressurization system. Road closures suggest that SpaceX will begin the next round of Ship 24 tests, presumably cryo-proof tests, as early as Tuesday. SpaceX is also preparing Starship suborbital launch pad A for structural stress tests on Ship 24. They have already installed six thrust rams on the pad to simulate the thrust of vacuum and sea level engines of the ship. Once the structural stress test and cryo-proof tests are complete, SpaceX will install Raptor version 2 engines on the ship and begin the static fire test campaign. The deadline of the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration's environmental assessment of Starbase to ensure safe spaceflight operations is approaching. The environmental review and permitting processes are expected to be completed by May 31. 
According to reliable sources such as Ars Technica senior space editor Eric Berger, SpaceX is likely to receive approval to proceed with experimental Starship launches, but they will have to make some accommodations for environmental impacts. Last week, Tim Dodd the everyday astronaut published the second part of his latest and exclusive interview with Elon Musk. The interview started with a discussion of the Super Heavy Booster. According to Musk, Super Heavy Boosters currently weighs 250 tons, but SpaceX is planning to bring it down to 200 tons in the near future. He also reiterated the booster catching sequence during the interview. To catch the booster that comes at half the speed of sound, the tower arms will first extend as much as possible before closing in as the booster descends through the arms. This will ensure the lifting lugs on the booster are caught by the stubs of the tower arms. It's intended to close on the methane tank, so the smooth upper section about the top third of the rocket, and then you can keep translating down okay. and, and catch on those nubs that stick out yeah. of the rocket. When Tim Dot inquired about the status of the Starship human landing system, Musk stated that while computer design and some hardware had been completed, SpaceX's current priority is to get Starship into orbit. He also mentioned that the first of the Starlink version 2 satellites, which were to be launched into orbit on Starship 24 during the orbital flight test, had arrived at Starbase. According to Musk, those second-generation Starlink satellites are 7 meters long and weigh 1.25 metric tons each. As a result, Falcon 9 rockets have neither the volume nor the mass-to-orbit capability required to launch them. Yeah, so we need Starship to work and to fly frequently uh, or Starlink 2 will be stuck on the ground. The celebrity billionaire has shared a lot more information about Starship and Starbase in the two-part interview with Tim Dodd. Don't forget to watch the full interview on Everyday Astronauts channel if you haven't already. I'll put the link in the description. Now, let's move on to other Starship updates. The Booster Quick Disconnect Plumbing Shield, which will protect the QD plumbing and electrical lines from the flames during the Starship launch, was installed on May 23. It was a fit check performed by SpaceX. Three days later, SpaceX teams removed the shield from the launch mount. If you recall, on April 28, SpaceX installed a brand new quick disconnect mechanism on the launch tower to replace the old QD system. Movement checks on this newly installed Starship quick disconnect mechanism were performed for the first time on Friday, May 27. At the Starbase build site, part of Super Heavy Booster 10 was spotted for the first time. The spotted component was the booster's common dome. Last week, at its McGregor rocket development facility, SpaceX fired a Raptor version 2 engine on a horizontal test stand for 365 seconds. That was the longest second-generation Raptor engine test at McGregor. The previous record was set two weeks ago at 360 seconds. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.